Uh, most of my meetings don't last very long. As I said, if you look at my calendar, it looks like I'm really busy, uh, but they don't always last that long. So come by, and I'm, I'll, I'll be happy to try to squeeze you in. Uh, I, I will plan a review session. I haven't set the time and date, but it will likely be Saturday evening. There goes your Saturday evening, right? Um, it will likely be Saturday evening. I don't like doing it the night before the exam, partly because I like to get it videotaped and posted for those who want to see it. Um, but it almost certainly will be Saturday evening. Slight chance it will be Friday evening. So we'll see. Friday evening, I think, wouldn't work for a lot of you who are going to be gone, right? Get the ones that are going to be gone? <laughs> You're gone now, oh, okay. Meeting, yeah. Okay. I would typically have the review session at about five, so that probably, yeah, so that that probably wouldn't work. So it'll probably be Saturday. Uh, just and I usually do it like about 48 hours before the thing. So I haven't scheduled a room yet, so I'll let you know about that. I'll, I'll uh, try to get that scheduled by tomorrow, so we can we can um, you can make plans. And I will videotape it, so if you can't make it, you can watch the videotape. And I strongly encourage if you have questions, just come see me. I mean, that's all that I do in the review session is answer questions. So you can get questions answered in front of a group, or you can come and you can answer, ask questions of me individually. Either way, I think the most important thing is that you get your questions answered. OK? All right. Well, um, what I want to do today is finish up the material for the exam, which will be the last of the enzyme stuff. And there's not an awful lot of stuff here to do. Uh, it is probably something that I think most students would consider the most interesting aspect um, of the enzymes, and that's the inhibition. So inhibition of enzymes is important uh, from uh, the perspective of treating disease, for example. So if I want to um, kill a bacterium, if I design a drug that kills an essential enzyme of theirs, that bacterium is not going to be able to survive. Okay? So inhibiting enzymes is very useful for drug purposes. Inhibiting enzymes occurs frequently in our own bodies by a natural process. I described last time, for example, how ATCase was inhibited by CTP. That's a very natural thing that's going on. So it's not an unnatural drug kind of thing we think of inhibiting enzymes. So it's important we understand something about how enzymes get inhibited. Okay? In this class, we're going to talk about two main mechanisms of inhibiting enzymes. And I want to describe them to you in words, as I'm fond of doing. Uh, so that you can get a feel for what's going on with these uh, enzymes and what's going on with this type of inhibition, and then we can look at it graphically, okay? Okay, so let's think about this enzyme. This enzyme that I have is um, an enzyme that catalyzes, let's say, the breakdown of, uh, a, of glucose, a sugar, okay? So let's say I've got an enzyme that's break that catalyzes the breakdown of glucose. That means that that enzyme has a shape and it has a pocket inside of it that fits glucose very nicely. We talked about the lock and key thing, where that molecule fits into that enzyme kind of like a key fits into a lock. And the enzyme doesn't work like a lock. We talked about that. But, but the, the fit is very much like a key fits into a lock. So molecules that have a structure like glucose will also fit into that enzyme in some cases if I'm very careful about how I design my molecules. So let's say I've got this enzyme that normally um, binds to glucose and does something to glucose. So it's got a pocket for glucose. And let's say then that I decide, well, I want to inhibit this enzyme from working. I'm going to design a drug, and this is the enzyme I want to target. What I'm going to do, or one of the ways I could do that, would be to design a molecule that looks very much like glucose and fits in this enzyme's site. Now, more importantly, when it fits in that enzyme site, the enzyme can't do anything. So in essence, while it's sitting there in the enzyme's site, it's stopping the enzyme from functioning. Okay? Now, this molecule that I've just designed has the ability to go into the enzyme and come out of the enzyme. It's not a covalent linkage. It just binds to it. And while it's sitting there, the enzyme isn't doing anything. But later, the enzyme lets go of it. Okay? That's actually a, des uh, a design that's used for uh, chemotherapy drugs in some cases. Okay? So certain drugs that um, are used to treat cancers are inhibiting enzymes that cancer cells need. But it turns out that normal cells need them too. <laughs> 
So if I designed a drug that only went in and just stuck on the enzyme and didn't do anything, I would be killing normal cells as well as cancer cells. I don't want to do that. So what I do is I give the drug for a short period of time where the cancer cell might be more susceptible and the normal cells live. Okay? So having that design where it doesn't covalently bind is one strategy and the two types of inhibition that I'm going to be talking about both use what are called non-covalent means of binding. They can come in and they can come off. Your cells, when that, when that ATCase I talked about yesterday binds CTP, it doesn't bind it forever. It lets go of it and then it's able to do something else. Okay? So we have to recognize that these inhibitors that I'm going to be talking about do not bind irreversibly. There are some that bind irreversibly. Penicillin, for example, irreversibly binds to an enzyme in bacteria and knocks out that enzyme. We don't care. We don't have that enzyme. Okay? It's what's called a suicide inhibitor. The enzyme commits suicide by binding to it because it looks like the normal substrate, but then penicillin covalently binds to it and it's stuck. The enzyme is dead and it kills the bacterium. But all I'm going to be talking about are the non-covalent, ones that don't bind irreversibly. Okay. Well, let's go back to what I just described. I've got this enzyme and I've designed a molecule that looks like glucose. It binds to this pocket inside this enzyme and when it's there, the enzyme doesn't do anything. Okay. Let's imagine now that I, went, I go back and I do that experiment that I described yesterday. Okay? The experiment I described to you yesterday, I took velocity and plotted it versus substrate concentration. I took 20 tubes. And the only variable in those 20 tubes was the concentration of substrate. It kept getting greater and greater and greater and greater. And when I added the same amount of enzyme for the same amount of time, I saw the velocity went up and it, it sort of leveled off. Okay? Let's imagine now I take those 20 tubes. And in those 20 tubes, I put a fixed amount, underline that, fixed amount of inhibitor. Okay? So I have a fixed amount of inhibitor that's in there. What do you suppose I'm going to see on that plot of V versus S? Is it going to start out at the same velocity? No, because the inhibitor is going to be competing with the substrate. They look alike, right? At low concentration, the inhibitor has a greater effect on the enzyme. That is, low, low concentration of substrate. The inhibitor has a greater effect on the substrate than when I get to a high concentration. When I get to a high concentration, I might have a million to one ratio of substrate to inhibitor. At the low concentrations, I might have equal amounts of substrate and inhibitor. So it's much more likely at low concentrations that the inhibitor is going to bind to the enzyme than it is at very high concentrations of the substrate because the concentration of the inhibitor is not changing. The ratio of substrate to inhibitor is changing. What does this mean? It means that if I keep adding more and more and more and more substrate, eventually the inhibitor is going to be essentially non-existent. Because it might be a million to one. The likelihood that the inhibitor is going to bind the enzyme is one in a million. I wouldn't be able to measure that difference in an experiment. Now, why is that significant? It's significant because it means that Vmax, for this type of inhibition, doesn't change. Because I can always counteract the inhibitor with enough substrate. I keep adding more and more and more substrate. They're both competing for the same site on the enzyme the substrate is eventually going to just make the inhibitor as if it's invisible. So for this type of inhibition, which is called competitive inhibition, Vmax does not change. It remains the same. Does that make sense? A few people say yes. It, that's ex exactly right. It does not change compared to the uninhibited reactions. So if I compare the inhibited reactions to the uninhibited reactions for a competitive inhibition, no change in Vmax. What do you suppose is going to happen to Km? The affinity. How do we measure Km? It's not half of Vmax. That's danger, right? <laughs> 
It's, the, it's a substrate concentration that gives half of Vmax. Do you suppose it's going to take more substrate to get to half of Vmax with a competitor? Yes, because it's at lower concentrations. The lower concentrations are going to have an effect. So we see that Km is going to increase when we have a competitive inhibitor. Okay, Km is going to increase. All right, do you see why it's a competitive inhibitor? They're both trying to get to the same site, and it's a numbers game. At high concentrations, the inhibitor doesn't have much chance. It's about as good, got about as much chance as you have of winning the lottery. At low concentrations, it's got much better chance, and that's when you want to buy your lottery ticket. Okay? All right, that's competitive inhibition. Now, your book has some figures that unfortunately don't show this very well, but this does show what happens. So what I've just described to you is a competitive inhibition. Here's the enzyme, here's the normal substrate, here's the competitive inhibitor, and notice the competitive inhibitor looks very much like the normal substrate such that it fits in here, but when it fits in here, the enzyme is sitting there going tweedledee, tweedledum, can't do anything, and the enzyme is not functioning. Most drugs that we design to treat diseases are competitive inhibitors. Most drugs are. They look like the normal substrate. Now there's another type of inhibition that we need to consider. I'll let you write all that down. Another type of inhibition occurs that's called non-competitive. Now, non-competitive is fundamentally different from competitive because the non-competitive inhibitor does not bind to the substrate binding site. By the way, the song I sang yesterday talked about the active site. The active site is where the reaction occurs on the enzyme. It's actually, a lot of people use it in the same uh, uh, language as the substrate binding site. That's the active site of the enzyme. Okay. A non-competitive inhibitor does not bind at the active site. It does not bind at the substrate binding site. Instead, it binds to a completely different site on the enzyme. And when it binds to that completely different site, it still is able to inhibit the enzyme. It might be changing the shape of the enzyme. It might be changing some aspect of the enzyme such that it can no longer catalyze a reaction either. Okay. Now, in this case, it doesn't have to resemble the substrate. It simply has to recognize some portion of the enzyme, and it probably does not look like the substrate at all. Now, this means that our experiment is going to be fundamentally different. Okay? Nothing is going to compete with that inhibitor for the enzyme. Once I add a set amount of inhibitor to the enzyme, that number of enzymes is always going to be inhibited. Always going to be inhibited because nothing's competing with it. Maybe I've got 20% of the enzymes inhibited. It doesn't matter how much substrate I add, I'm always going to have the fixed amount of enzymes that will be inhibited. Does that make sense? In non-competitive inhibition, I cannot out-compete the inhibitor with the substrate. Only with competitive inhibition can I do that. Yes, back in the back. Yep, yep, it's hydrogen bound. And so you might say, well, if it comes off, then the enzyme becomes active. Well, yeah, but then on average it goes to something else. But it does not stay stuck to the same enzyme. That's a very important point. Yep. Okay? Now, we can't outcompete the inhibitor with the substrate. So even at the high concentration of the substrate, I'm going to have the same percentage of enzyme inhibited as I had in the lowest concentration. Now, what did I say happens to Vmax if I change the amount of enzyme? It changes, right? So if I reduce the amount of enzyme with an inhibitor, what's going to happen to Vmax? It's going to go down. So in non-competitive inhibition, Vmax decreases. 